and I'm going to be the one that is hosting the uh, from loans to laundry financial aid and student account questions for everyone and um, we'll get started. I'll introduce you to Sally Heckendorn. She is the assistant bursar and also Leah Young, who is the financial aid director. And I Thank will you. hand it over to Leah Young. Okay. Thanks, Diane. Um, so I have likely um, been in front of many of you over various uh, webinars in the past. Um, and my, my time here is going to be very short. Diane is going to do the bulk of the presenting today because in all likelihood, you've most likely completed all of your financial aid to-do list at this time. Um, so she's going to go over how that interplays with the bill. And I'm just here to go over some um, highlights of timelines in the future. So you know what financial aid um, action items are gonna look like going forward. Um, so October 1st, 2021 is when the new FAFSA and CSS profile opens for next year. Um, but for continuing students, you do not have to complete those forms until May 1st, 2022. Um, so you have a little more time than you had last year in trying to get those all in. Um, and the financial aid awards are released in late June of each year for continuing students prior to the bills going out um, in early July. Um, so just so you don't panic next year when you think I had my aid for the, fir for the first year, um, significantly early, uh, that, is, that is not the case for continuing students. Um, keep in mind, we always try to keep your grant as steady as possible for future years. We are going to um, do everything we can to protect that grant. However, if there are major changes to your situation, such as uh, you suddenly came into a huge inheritance, uh, you started earning significantly more money, maybe a sibling graduated from college. Those are reasons why your grant eligibility could be, um, could be going down. So feel free to reach out to your counselor at any time to discuss changes. And that includes those that are not so positive and quite honestly, probably more likely. Things like um, you know, unexpected major expenses, things like jobs, job losses, um, medical expenses, things that are creating a major hardship um, on your family. Please don't necessarily wait for these timelines here. Please reach out to your financial aid counselor if you are experiencing that. It generally takes about six to 10 weeks from a major event, um, especially things like job loss to understand what your unemployment benefits are, uh, you know, what your severance might be and to, to understand what your job prospects may look like. So we generally, recommend waiting that time frame if something were to happen like that. Um, the other thing, if you have questions about student and parent loans, if you haven't had those set up yet, there is still time. Um, and you can, um, if you have any questions about that, we provide all of the application instructions on our website. If you go to the loan um, and financing section and click under each type of loan, uh, you can find the, the instructions to complete those there. And we have a comparison chart um, that shows the differences between private and federal loans, as well as a link to Elm Select, which shows you historical lenders that other folks have used in recent years. Um, so please feel free to reach out with those questions. Um, and that is essentially my part of this presentation. I'll be here to answer questions. We do have the Q&A box down at the bottom and both Sally and I will be answering questions there or if there's something that is, we think is really great for everyone to know, we'll be flagging those to be answered live um, and we'll interrupt slash wait for Diane to finish as appropriate in order to answer those questions. So feel free to put those there um, and we'll either address those live or in, uh, in those boxes publicly. So have a, a I hope you enjoy the rest of this presentation. Diane has lots of really great details for you that you didn't even know you wanted or needed to know, but are fabulous to know. So before um, 
Diane, get started, Leah. We do have three questions out there. Uh, two are very similar. So of course, one is, do you have to complete both the um, FAFSA and the CSS profile each year? Um, and then of course, uh, if your circumstances remain the same, you should also then do the FAFSA and CSS every year as well, correct? That is actually then, um, that is actually a really amazing question, and I can't believe I forgot to mention that. Um, so, essentially, um, you do not have to complete both forms each year if your financial situations are similar. Um, to renew at the same grant level, uh, again, assuming none of those major fluctuations of positive income. Um, you just need to fill out the FAFSA to renew if you have had things like a student um, it has entered college that generally causes a shift in eligibility and you may qualify for more aid and we recommend you do the CSS profile that is really to um, to to take another hard look at your institutional aid eligibility um, so that's when we really need the CSS profile otherwise you can just do the FAFSA which is a lot simpler and less time consuming so Leah, another question they have is, um, how do they know who their financial aid counselor is and uh, how would they re reach out to them? Absolutely, so that's also on our website. Um, so the uh, if you just type in the search bar, financial aid staff, that's the page that pops up first. And we actually have online scheduling available. Uh, so their email address is included on there, but right in that on that website, you can sign up for a phone or video. Um, meeting with them, you know, uh, eventually we'll have in person options available, uh, you know, in a, in a couple months as well. Uh, so that is where you can go to find all of that good information. Okay, um, there are they just keep coming in here. Let's I see, see what we have. Um, so if you want to keep going down through and you answer as you need you go right ahead. Sure. Um, so questions of student loans. Um, if the student received as part of the package, is there action that needs to happen now? Um, so yes, students have been emailed about those steps. Um, so you may want to check in with them to make sure that they review that email from our office. It's simply completing the master promissory note on studentaid.gov, um, as well as the entrance counseling. And the entrance counseling informs folks, uh, borrowers of their responsibilities and rights as a borrower. And that's required by the Department of Ed when they borrow a loan. Um, that is also on the loans and financing web page. If you click onto those direct unsubsidized loans, um, that will be those instructions and links will be there on that website. If you have an institutional loan, the Hurwitz loan, um, student accounts office will be in touch next month with the um, information on how to um, complete that master promissory note online. Um, I'm going to answer the work study question live too because a lot of people have this. That does not apply directly to, student, to the student account. It is paid as a paycheck. So it's really designed to, um, to handle, to, to be used for those non-build expenses like books and travel and personal expenses. Um, so it's paid as it's earned. Um, in most cases, you can make more than the amount on the award. Um, it's really up to the department you're employed by and how much they have in their budget to pay that student. Um, so if the student exhausts that award, they may be switched to institutional work study. Um, so that's really up to, up, again, up to the student and the department as to how they want to um, handle that workload. Um, I am this I'll, I'll leave the transportation question to Diane because I think she covers that in her presentation. Um, if you've secured the loan, Dickinson will automatically pull from the loan account directly. So that comes in, assuming it's a student loan from the Federal Plus loan or a student financial, a student loan company, those come into the college automatically and they are applied um, to your student account. So there's no separate payment. It doesn't come to you first. Um, um, I'm looking at Laurie Dixon's question and I'm gonna recommend that she reaches out to her financial aid quest, uh, counselor um, to run some numbers, 
you know, no rush, but maybe later this fall um, to see how that may play into aid eligibility. CSS stands for the College Scholarship Service, and that's a college board form that many um, institutions use to get a little more information than the FAFSA. Um, it helps us understand a family's full financial picture. Um, and grants are different than scholarship. Grants are considered need-based, where scholarships are considered merit-based. Um, when I refer to the website, I'm actually referring to our general um, website that anyone can see. It does not require any, um, any access. I'm going to actually type an answer to that, so let's not mark that answered. And I will put in some links there that folks can see to our Elm Select, Parent Plus, um, student loans, and, and their counselors. Um, so I'll grab that after I'm, I'm done uh, talking and, and put that there. Um, if you receive a merit scholarship and you're not interested in pursuing need-based aid, a FAFSA is not required to renew that. Those scholarships are, are based on uh, a review at the time of admission and continued uh, a continued 3.0 GPA or above. Um, for students who do struggle that first year, we do allow at least one semester of probation if they're not at 3.0 immediately. FAFSA completed annually, CSS only if circumstances change. I'm confirming that. Um, are federal loans available for summer? If you take at least two courses in the summer, they are. Otherwise, um, the only availability is private loans. Um, the Hurwitz loan is a need-based loan. So it is um, assigned based on a need-based application. If, um, if you have need and are um, have a, a specific struggle, again, reach out to your counselor to review if we might be able to consider eligibility for that loan. How long does it take the, um, the, the loans to reflect on the bill? Um, so no loan is gonna reflect on the bill until 10 days before the start of the term because that is a required regulation that loans must uh, be held until 10 days before the start of the term. Um, but once, we, once you sign that and complete counseling, the Department of Ed sends us a feed um, and we usually get that once every few days. Um, so it will be a pretty quick turnaround for that to disperse as long as it's um, within that 10 day period. And loans, when federal loans are very quick to process, generally within a week, private loans can take two to three weeks depending on how fast your lender is at processing those. We then certify that you're eligible and then there's a 10 day waiting period um, to get for those loans to be sent. Um, quick question about the, <laughs> you all have a lot of questions. This is great. I definitely wanna leave time for Diane so I'm talking fast. Um, loans do have an origination fee. So when you're seeing the 2721 per semester um, and uh, you can reduce that if you do not only want to, if you do not want to borrow that full amount. So all you need to do is send an email to either loans at dickinson.edu or finaid at dickinson.edu and we will reduce the overall loan amount with um, a simple email from the student's Dickinson email address. Um, can students who do not have aid work on campus? The answer is yes. All first year students should have received an email from our student employment office, letting them know that they can sign up for work. And it is um, all first year students are eligible to work in the dining hall, whether or not they have federal work study. Um, in future years, it will depend on the department they want to work for, and if they have a budget to hire students who are not on federal work study. Um, but the, the dining, um, dining is always an option for students who want to work. Uh, again, ask students to look for that email that was sent out recently from Student Employment, and that outlines the process. Our Student Employment Office runs that. Um, Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't wanna miss the overarching, um, the overarching information that is left here. So I think I have answered many 
of these questions. I'm just scanning uh, quickly to see if there's any really important things to answer live. And otherwise, I will start typing out answers and let Diane speak. Um, the other piece is, will tuition fluctuate if our stu children study abroad for a semester? The tuition is the same as long as they're in a Dickinson program. That is one great advantage. Um, the tuition is the same whether they are on campus or off campus. Um, or, or sorry, if they are on campus or in that program. And their aid will go with them. Really, the additional fees you can expect for that are airline costs and some visa fees. Other than that, your aid and tuition will um, stay the same. All right, um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Diane. Um, I said I wouldn't talk long and I, I lied, but I really thank you for your great questions. I'll continue um, answering them in the chat here as we go along. Thank you very much, Leah, I appreciate it. And as again, thank you all for attending this Zoom meeting and I hope that we can cover a lot of your um, questions, answer all of your questions. Um, so for my first slide, we're going to dive into the monthly billing statements. Dickinson College generates the July tuition bills or the fall semester tuition bills early July, and they do reflect the due date of the end of July. We do give all of our families a grace period to have your tuition out of pocket costs paid in full directly to Dickinson before the start of the semester. So your July billing statement that you have in hand, even though that it does reflect the due date of the end of July, you do technically have until the start of classes, August 30th, to have your out-of-pocket costs paid in full without being financed, uh, any, uh, assessed any finance fees or penalties in any way. I do generate bills on a monthly basis. So you will receive a bill at the beginning of every month, anytime that there is activity reflected on your student's account. Spring semester tuition bills are generated early January with the due date of the middle of January because that is whenever spring semester starts. On your tuition billing statements, like Leah indicated, you more than likely will see memoed financial aid on there if your student is receiving federal loan funds or if there are other aid items that financial aid is still in need of additional information from the student or family to complete. So anytime that you do see memoed financial aid on your billing statement and you just want verification that everything has been completed on your student's end or on your end, by all means, give our office a call. We can verify that for you. And um, you may then manually subtract off those memoed aid line items from your total due and submit the difference. Again, as long as you know that your student is planning on taking out those federal loan funds. As I indicated earlier, monthly billing statements are generated the beginning of every month. One is automatically sent to your student through their gateway portal. They do receive an email notification from our office letting them know that there is a billing statement out there on their gateway for them to view and potentially pay off on their gateway portal as well. One is also sent to the family, whether it is through the parent proxy access, which your student has to grant you access to receive. If the parent is not set up with parent proxy access, then a hard bill is mailed to the student's permanent home address. If the student does change their home address, please have your student send an email to the registrar's office. Their email address is reg r ralph e edward g george at dickinson.edu indicating what their new permanent home address is so that that is updated amongst all of our offices for any further communications that Dickinson College sends out to your student. Parent proxy access. Again, your student needs to grant this access to multiple parents, multiple users, whoever they feel should have this online ability to view their student account information, financial aid information, and even the registrar's information, which would go into detail of the student's classes, their uh, grades, any holds, things of that nature. Here is a link that the students will go through 
to uh, follow the step-by-step -step instructions to activate the parent. This link is on dickinson.edu's website in the upper right-hand corner where the search box is. You can type in proxy access and then click on the student instructions. The most important thing whenever the students complete these steps is there is a tab after they uh, do the profile tab with listing you as a parent proxy user and your relationship to them is the authorization tab. And that I will show you in a next screen. The authorization tab is where your student will pick and choose what they want this proxy user to have the ability to view. That is very, very important and oftentimes is missed. So um, just make sure that your student does follow all of these steps completely. Uh, once your student does give you this online access, you will have your own PIN number that you set up and you will receive an email with that instruction on how to proceed. Uh, anytime that a monthly billing statement is generated, you along with your student will receive an email notification from our office letting you know that a billing statement has been generated and that you may now log on to your parent proxy portal to view the bill. You also have the ability to pay online through your parent proxy portal. And if you pay online through your parent proxy portal, you have the option of paying via a credit card or debit card, which you would be assessed a fee. It's a 2.6% fee, or you can pay using your bank account. No additional fees are assessed to you when paying through your bank account and your payment will be reflected in real time. This is also a secured site. It does not keep your payment information by any means. So anytime that you do want to make a payment online, whether it is through your student's gateway portal or through your parent proxy portal, you will have to plug in your payment information every time. This is that authorization screen that I was indicating earlier where your student, student can select all or pick and choose what they want you to have access to view. As I indicated also earlier, payment methods online through the student's gateway portal or through the parent proxy portal, credit card, debit card, you would be assessed that fee. ACH automatic withdrawal from your checking or savings account, no fee assessed. Your payment would be reflected in real time. And if you were to go through Dickinson College's website directly, if you do not have a parent proxy portal access or your student gateway access on dickinson.edu in the upper right hand corner, you can type, it, type in payment methods and follow the ACI payment link to make an electronic payment to your student's account. Other payment methods that we participate with is Nelnet. Nelnet is a monthly payment plan. There is the link for mycollegepaymentplan.com backslash Dickinson backslash. That is where you can spread out your out of pocket cost with Nelnet into a monthly payment plan. And I'll go into further detail on that in a few screens here. Another one is Flywire, that is for foreign currency payments. By all means, you can still mail us in your check payment. And there is our mailing address, Dickinson College Attention Student Accounts, PO Box 1773, Carlisle, PA 17013. If by any chance you or your 529 plan or someone wants the physical mailing address, it would still be Dickinson College Attention Student Accounts and the physical mailing address would be 28 North College Street, Carlisle, PA 17013. We also accept wire transfers. If you want our wiring information, you can give our office a call or send our office an email. And we also do accept cash payments. Nelnet monthly payment plan, as I indicated before, it spreads out your out of pocket expense. Nelnet does take your word on what you need to budget. They do not have access 
to what aid or outside scholarship funds your student is receiving. So whenever you do click the enrollment button to enroll in the Nelnet monthly payment plan, whether it is for fall semester or spring semester, it asks in the first section of what your charges consist of. That is where you can plug in your semester's tuition room, board, any other charges that your student is being assessed in that area. And then the next area, it asks for what deductions you want to subtract off of those charges, which would be your loans, your financial aid, grant scholarships, any outside scholarships, or if you have um, any relatives or other monies coming in from other avenues that will be coming directly to the college, you can put that into that deduction box. Nelnet will do the math for you to come up with what difference you would like to budget with Nelnet, and they will tell you that dollar amount, and then you can accept to sign up for their monthly payment plan option. They do charge you a $35 enrollment fee per semester. That is the only cost to you. The maximum amount of a per semester payment plan would be a five month payment plan. Fall semester that went into effect the beginning of June and it runs until August. So if you were interested in setting up a Nelnet monthly payment plan now for fall semester, they would be offering you a three month payment plan that goes into effect August 3rd and runs until October 3rd. You will need to plug in payment information. They do automatic withdrawals from either your bank account or a credit card, whatever payment method you would like to plug in there. Payments are withdrawn the fifth of every month. Um, for spring semester, you can enroll in their five month payment plan as early as October to be logged in, to be linked in to a November through March monthly payment plan. Um, again, fall deadline date to enroll in a fall monthly payment plan is August 3rd. For spring semester, the absolute deadline date to enroll in a monthly payment plan is December 30th. How Dickinson works with Nelnet is we automatically pre-apply your full Nelnet budget for that given semester up front on your student's account. We then wait for your monthly payments to pay us back. So anytime that you receive a monthly billing statement from Dickinson and it reflects a balance owing, that would be over and above your current Nelnet budget amount. If you need to adjust your Nelnet budget, increase or decrease, you will log on to your Nelnet contract and do so through their site. Again, we are always here to help. If you want to crunch figures with us, or if you want clarification on what you need to increase or decrease your budget by, all you gotta do is give our office a call and we'll be able to further assist you. Ladies, am I good on answering everything? Is there any questions that I need to address? Diane, we're, we're trying to get through them. Um, yes, there are a couple, um, and you might have answered uh, before in the slide as well. Um, they, I saw a question about how to access the parent proxy, and I believe you went over that. Um, we have the link in the, um, in the uh, slideshow for them. Um, so they also want to know, which I'll answer right now since I'm live, uh, they're asking the question between a proxy and a power of attorney. Power of attorney, you have a physical paper that you have completed showing that you're a power of attorney for your student. Um, the proxy, the actual student online, you only get access to what they're granting access um, to you when they enroll you as the proxy. Um, so of course the the power of attorney is one piece that is basically giving you authorization from that student on a piece of paper for more than just what the scope of the proxy is for electronic purposes. There's also, which I don't think I heard Diane get to yet, the FERPA uh, release, which then um, is a student needing to complete the um, paperwork for a parent to uh, have access or to discuss the student's um, financial aid, academic, whatever else might be out there besides the billing piece of it. Um, 
that gives them access to do that. Um, I'm so sorry, Diana, sorry, I did skip over that FERPA. Oh, okay, well then, then I will um, back out of here. I will continue down the list, but those are a couple of things that I've seen. Um, they're asking uh, five, 529 questions as well. I've been trying to type back single answers. I will those. go over that as well. Yep, yep. And then I've indicated um, some wire, uh, just indicate that if they're wiring, then um, they just want to contact us as well. So I will let you proceed with your piece. But yeah, if you'd go over the FERPA piece as well, that's great. Yes, I will. So first off, the FERPA release. Um, that is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. We do request that the students complete the FERPA form online. And here are the instructions on where your student would find that. It's through the registrar's offices link under forms. And that once the student signs off on that, that allows a, a, the majority of all Dickinson offices to be able to speak with the parents um, on anything related to um, your student. Uh, a, a parent had asked where they find the proxy instructions. Our Dickinson website is very user friendly. And I say this because I have two students, two children that attended other institutions and dealing with their websites and things of that nature. I, I do say that Dickinson's website is very user friendly. In our search box, you can type in proxy access and it will provide you a link for student instructions. And there is also a link that's uh, for parent instructions to guide you. But again, all you have to do is give our office a call and my phone number is gonna be listed at the end of this PowerPoint that you can give our office a call at any time and we can assist you in all of those steps. Another key thing also, our firewall is very, Thick. So you will always want to make sure that you are on an actual computer, not on your phone or an iPad when wanting to access anything on Dickinson's site through your parent proxy site or through your student's gateway portal. Um, 529 plans. Since you all have the billing statement in hand, you're, uh, you can contact your 529 and let them know of uh, what they what you want them to pay Dickinson. A lot of 529s mail us a hard check, which is perfectly fine. They would mail it to Dickinson College Attention Student Accounts at the PO Box 1773 Carlisle PA 17013. Some of them ask for a physical mailing address, which I went over before. It's 28 North College Street. Carlisle PA. And once we receive your 529 plan check, it will be posted to your student's account. We ask that you inform them to put your student's name and their student ID number on the memoed line of the check. Same thing applies with outside scholarship checks. If your student is receiving outside scholarship funds, once we receive that check, it will be posted and reflected on your student's account. Perfect. Diane, would you be able to go back to the Nelnet slide? Thank you. I have a question besides the enrollment fee per semester. Is there an interest charged for using the Nelnet monthly payment plan? There is not. Nelnet only charges you a $35 enrollment fee. That is the only cost to you. Since this Nelnet is set up for automatic withdrawals from your uh, payment method of choice, there is no additional fee. By any means, if your payment were to be rejected, then Nelnet would charge you a fee. Um, if your payment is rejected twice, Nelnet terminates you from the payment plan, and then you would have to settle everything up with Dickinson College directly. So Diane, I have another question then regarding Nelnet. Do you have to enroll now into Nelnet annually? Or if you enroll once, does it carry over from year to year? It does not. It's per semester. So if you enroll in a Nelnet payment plan for the fall semester, that only covers you for fall semester. You will receive an email notification from Nelnet and also from myself 
sometime during the month of October, letting you all know that it is now time for you to enroll in a spring Nelnet monthly payment plan. So you would need to enroll in their monthly payment plan per semester. Diane, another question about Nelnet. Um, we have one asking if the 529 plan can pay directly through Nelnet. I'm not sure. I will answer that. Okay. You, you, you don't want that. Um, for tax purposes, if you have 529 plan funds, you will always want your 529 plan to pay the college or institution directly. That makes it a clear black and white uh, path that the um, IRS and your accountant can clearly see that you utilized your 529 plan and paid the institution directly. Same thing goes with um, you don't want your 529 plan sending the check to you or to your student and then putting that money into your personal account and then paying the college. It's always best to make it as clear cut and dry when using 529 plans to have them submit the payment directly to the college. In addition to that, let's say you don't have an, a, an abundance amount of 529 plan funds and you're still having to pay something out of pocket directly to the college over and above your 529 plan. You can still budget the difference with Nelnet. And in that calculation area, and by all means, we're always here to help you crunch figures, um, minus off any aid that you're receiving, minus off any 529 plan funds that your 529 plan will be sending directly to the college, and then budget the difference with Nelnet. So there's a lot of different avenues of where monies can be flowing into the college to pay for your student semester's out-of-pocket cost. All righty, uh, Diane, another one. Um, um, if two parents are on Nelnet and paying different percentages of the bill, how is that automatically deducted? So um, there, there are multiple family members that may sign up with a Nelnet payment plan for one individual student. And whenever I get the report from Nelnet, which I get a report at the end of every month, I will be pre-applying the Nelnet budget onto your student's account. It does not specify on your student's account with Dickinson College whose payment plan is which. It just says Nelnet payment for whatever given semester it is linked to. Obviously that parent would know if that is their budget or someone else's budget. Um, we, since there are monies coming in from multiple parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles onto one individual student's account, anytime that there is a balance remaining owing the bill goes out to the student and whomever is listed as a parent proxy user or the permanent home address. We do not get involved in who's responsible for what percentage as long as your student's account is paid in full by the due date, your student would be in good standings. Um, uh, and there is a question uh, too I saw out here. Um, releases for uh, HIPAA regulation. Um, I do believe that the wellness center um, has a form that they will have to complete um, upon arrival on campus. Is that correct? Do you know, Diane? Because I don't think we discussed that in our session. I don't discuss the wellness center stuff, uh, but I do believe that if you log on to dickinson.edu in the search box, type in wellness center, you should be able to get their email and phone number for contact to inquire about that question. All righty, so that one's done. Um, we haven't gone over our tuition insurance yet, correct? Nope. Okay, that was a question there. Um, we have a question, can we send money to the business office during the fall months for the spring semester tuition and fees, or is it preferred that bills are paid in January for the spring semester? We do prefer 
for you to wait until you receive your January spring semester tuition bill so that your payment is reflected in the new calendar year to be applied towards that semester. That's what we highly recommend. Perfect. Um, I think we've answered um, the holds in the proxy checklist is the only other thing. And I can answer that um, by typing something back. But if you needed to do something, I don't want to hold you up because we're, we've got about 20 minutes left of our one hour for these families. Very good. The next slide talks about health insurance. We do require all students to have health insurance coverage, whether it is provided by the college or by the family. You should have received a postcard in the mail from our insurance broker, RCMND asking you to log on to www.firststudent.com, all spelled out. On this site, we do ask that you either enroll in or waive out of Dickinson's health insurance. Action needs to be taken either way before August 31st. We do send out emails. We start to send out emails in August to the students if we see that action has not been taken on this site. And closer to the actual deadline date, our emails to your student get a little sterner, letting them know that you need to take action through this site and either enroll in or waive out of Dickinson's health insurance before August 31st, or else the college will automatically enroll you in the plan and bill you for it. The annual cost this year is $2,281. For those families that do enroll in the health insurance coverage, we as Dickinson split that cost in half and we will charge you half of that annual fee, $1,140.50 on your July billing statement or August billing statement. And the other half will be billed to you on your spring semester tuition bill in January. The coverage is a full year's coverage, which runs from August 1st, 2021 to July 31st of 2022. If you would like to um, get more detailed information regarding the plan, you may contact our insurance broker, which is Tim Cummings at RCMD at the phone number listed on this site, 1-800-346-4075, extension 1452. Student charging and declining balance. When your student arrives on campus, they'll be given a photo ID card. Their photo ID card acts like their lifeline here on campus. It will have their meal plan allotment on there, gives them access to their dormitory building, and it also gives them access to campus buildings after hours. It also acts like a credit card here on campus. So if your student does not have their own personal monies, or credit card on hand, and they want to purchase something at the college bookstore, the Devil's Den, which is like a little uni mart here on campus, any of the dining locations, the mail room, our wellness center, um, there's a college farm cart, and there's also outside vendors that will be coming here on campus that sell their merchandise. Merchandise anywhere from shoes, clothing, handbags, jewelry, posters, you name it, there's an outside vendor that comes here on campus that sells their merchandise. Your student has the ability to charge at all of those locations. Each department keeps a tally of what a student charges on a monthly basis. Those charges will then come over to me the end of that given month and be reflected on your next month's billing statement. It shows you somewhat of a detail, letting you know if it was the bookstore textbook related purchases, clothing, uh, miscellaneous oftentimes are those outside vendors, obviously dining services, wellness center, the FAS mailroom. So it does show you somewhat of a detail, letting you know what that charge was for. But by all means, if you ever need further detail of what that charge consisted of. You may contact my office or you may contact that department to ask for more detail on what your student charged. If you feel that your student um, is abusing that privilege 
or you do not want your student to have the charging privilege from the get-go, you can send our office an email asking for a no charging hold to be placed on their account. Oftentimes when students send me a no charging hold request, I ask the parent if they would like to permit their student to only charge textbooks and school supplies, or if they want the no charging hold across the board, nothing. And if the parent does allow the student to only charge textbooks and school supplies, I then inform the parent that their student will want to stop by the student accounts office prior to making that textbook purchase so that we can give them a little permission slip to go and charge only those items to their student account. Declining balance. Declining balance is handled through dining services and that is where you may preload your student's ID card with funds. So it acts like a debit card in, in addition to the whole charging aspect if you keep that turned on. Dining services declining balance account can be also used anywhere here on campus, not just dining locations, all of those locations listed above. In addition to one outside restaurant, which is the pizza grill, which is down by the football field. If your student wants to use their declining balance funds anywhere here on campus, whenever they hand their ID card to the cashier, they will need to specify that they wanna use their declining balance funds. This way the cashier can toggle into that specific area and deduct those monies from their declining balance. If the student does not specify to the cashier that they would like to use their declining balance because they're busy chit-chatting with friends or anything like that. The cashier is going to automatically assume that they want to charge it to their student account because all students are given that privilege. And if you do not have it turned off, that is where the charge will go. I do not have any way of withdrawing funds from your student's declining balance account to pay on their student account. So once the charge hits their student account, I have no way of going back and reversing that entry. Diane, while we're on the subject of declining balance, um, is there an advantage to declining balance over a student having a debit card? One advantage of having a declining balance account set up here at Dickinson is if your student uses their personal declining balance funds in any of the dining locations, they will receive a 10% discount. In addition to that, it gives them money management skills. Yes, their personal uh, debit card gives them that as well, but it's also another avenue here on campus for them to be given money management skills. The parent does not receive a monthly billing statement of what their student's declining balance funds remaining are. Your student needs to keep track of that through their gateway home screen. And on their gateway home screen, there will, will be a box that populates that says declining balance, and it does reflect to the student what their real time declining balance funds are. So Diane, of course you answered the one part for a parent, um, work study to pay for work study monies uh, cannot be deposited uh, directly into declining balance. If a student works on campus, whether it's work study, uh, federal work study or institutional work study, the student will be paid um, by check or directly uh, by direct deposit to their account. And then they can take either the funds um, and cash to the dining uh, services department or uh, write a check or use debit or credit card. I believe they can use as well in that area. That's right. And also declining to put funds onto your students declining balance. They don't have a site where you can do this online. You will actually need to call dining services at the phone number that I provide to you or your student or whenever you are here on campus delivering your student, you can go to the dining office, which is located in the upper level of the hub right on the back side of the cafeteria and pay them via cash, check, credit card or debit card. And so anytime that your student is running low on their declining balance funds, if they see that they're running low, your student can give you a call. Mom, dad, can you please add more money to my declining balance? And at that time you can call dining services or you can mail them in a check. Um, 
I'm looking here to see if we missed anything. Um, We've got a couple of questions about what happens if you don't use um, all of it at the end of the semester, as well as, you know, um, is does the meal plan include any declining balance? Is that um, yes. how that plays into it? So if it is declining that balance funds that you personally put onto your student's ID card, they will roll over semester by semester. And upon graduation or after graduation, if your student has a large declining balance fund remaining, the dining office will send them a refund check or direct deposit if the college has direct deposit information on file. If your student selects a meal plan for any given semester and dining services gives them declining balance monies or dining dollars based on the meal plan that they chose, those funds are under a use it or lose it policy. Obviously, those declining balance monies and dining dollars that are given to them based on their meal plan will be used first before dipping into your personal declining balance funds that you put onto your student's account. May I um, move on? Wait one minute. Um, wellness Center, um, the what fees are brought across um, from the Wellness Center uh, to the student account for charging purposes? Sure. So if your student goes to the Wellness Center, which our Wellness Center is open to all Dickinson students, regardless of what type of insurance coverage you have, whether it is your personal insurance or the Dickinson's insurance. The Wellness Center sees all students. If the Wellness Center administers any type of medicine, lab work, or um, any, anything of that nature, the Wellness Center will charge your student's account a copay dollar amount, ranging anywhere from $10, $20, $50, all based on what type of service they performed. Um, if and again, you'll get a monthly billing statement letting you know what your student uh, that charge consisted of. If you call our office, we do, student accounts office would not be able to provide you any detail. You would have to call the wellness center yourself or have your student explain that to you of why they went to a wellness center. From my understanding, whenever your student does go to the wellness center, they are provided an EOB form. And then your student may submit that EOB form to their health insurance provider for reimbursement. Okay. Um, oh, um, mm, mm, mm. Student charging does not offer 10% discount declining balance in the uh, dining services locations is the only time we can get the 10% discount. That's right. Only dining areas, you receive that 10% discount because dining services manages the declining balance accounts. Done. Um, and there are several dining locations that will be open this fall semester. In addition to the cafeteria, you have the Biblio, which is in the library. You have the underground, which is in the lower level of the hub. And you also have Union Station, which is in the upper level of the hub across from the cafeteria. Okay, so um, again, as, as always, families are not understanding the personal declining balance, which is totally separate from the meal plan declining uh, uh, dining dollars and the actual meal plan. Do we have a slide, Diane, that you could review again with the families? Because there are a number of questions um, related sure. to that. Um, so I don't have a slide regarding the meal plans, okay. but again, okay. our Dickinson website is very user friendly. So if you go on to dickinson.edu in the upper right hand corner, you can type in meal plans and there you can look at the detail of the meal plan options. All first year students are automatically defaulted to the any 20 meal plan. We do highly recommend that your student sticks with that any 20 meal plan, at least for their first semester here until they get acclimated. 
any 20 means that they get 20 meals per week, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, Monday through Friday, and brunch on Sunday, dinner on Sunday. That's their 20 meals. Um, there are other two other meal plans that students can pick and choose from, a Flexboard 1 and Flexboard 2. Again, on that meal plan site, it gives you further detail of what those flexible meal plans consist of. It's a point-based system. So all depending on where they go, when they eat, it's how many points are deducted from that point allotment for the semester. Dining Services realizes that based on those three meal plan selections, you're being charged a flat fee by the student accounts office for that meal plan for the given semester. So they compensate your student by giving them so much of declining balance funds to be used during the given semester under a use it or lose it policy and also dining dollars under a use it or lose it policy. And on that meal plan site through Dickinson's website, it goes into detail of what dining dollars means and what declining balance means. If your student is housed in an apartment style housing, obviously you're being billed a larger amount for the housing charge. Your student has the ability to log on to the meal plan selection prior to the start of the given semester and change their meal plan choice to an apartment flex meal plan. That is the fourth meal plan option, but it is only offered to students living in apartment style housing. That is a cheaper reduced rate. This year, the cost of it is $250 cheaper. That's your discounted rate. And it also gives the students a larger declining balance and a larger dining dollars with a smaller points per semester. Um, Diane, have you gone over the, um, the laundry piece yet? No, that's coming up. All right, so so let's go ahead and do that. I some of those questions are there. Oh, declining balance. If they use their card, a credit card, to pay to add money to declining balance, there is a fee assessed, right, um, through their credit card company. I don't believe dining services passes on a fee. I think okay. they eat the fee. Thank you. Yep. And do My you know where this where this uh, presentation will be uh, once uh, we're done? Do you yes. know where it'll be when it goes so, after? The orientation department will have it on their website. So again, dickinson.edu, type in orientation, and you'll be able to look, view it through their site. Perfect. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. GradGuard. GradGuard is a company that where you can um, sign up and pay for tuition insurance. GradGuard um, insures whatever dollar amount you specify that you would like to insure to cover if your student has to take a medical leave of absence. Dickinson does have our own refund policy in place, whereas if less than 60% of the given semester was completed, Dickinson will prorate your students tuition room and board fees along with financial aid um, and with that proration if it leaves you with a credit balance then Dickinson College will refund you that credit balance. If more than 60% of the given semester was completed then no proration would be done. Please note no matter if it's a medical leave of absence or if your student wants to withdraw, transfer out, any reason, your student needs to contact our registrar's office and inform them that they would like to leave for whatever reasons from Dickinson College so that all of the paperwork can be started. Once the paperwork is completed by your student and also the registrar's office, that is when your student's account will be reflected of any prorated amount if they are entitled to that. Again, grad guard will step in if your student has to take a medical leave of absence and you have the grad guard insurance. There is a form that you complete with grad guard detailing the medical leave of absence reasoning. Grad guard will send us a paperwork to complete 
letting us know of your students withdrawal and that they have purchased grad guard insurance so that we can inform grad guard if Dickinson is prorating any of your expenses and refunding you any funds so that grad guard will then pay you the remaining difference of what you insured so you you receive 100% of your insured dollar amount back. We do have a cashier's office here on campus. It's located in the student accounts office. Our cashier's office is open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Your students can cash personal checks up to $100 per day using their Dickinson ID card. That also covers if your student receives a birthday check in the mail from grandma and grandpa and um, they don't have a local bank here locally to go and cash that. They can bring it down to our cashier's office and cash it. If the check is over $100, we can stamp the back of that, cap, that check and your student may go to M&T Bank. We have a partnership with M&T Bank. They're two blocks away from campus and the M&T Bank office will cash the student's check up to $300. Your student will need to make sure that one, they come to our office first to get the back of the check stamped. And in addition to their Dickinson College ID, they will need one other form of identification for M&T Bank to cash that check for them. We also have an ATM machine here on campus. It's located in the upper level of the hub right by the Britain Plaza entrance to the hub. It is serviced by M&T Bank if your student or you do not bank with M&T Bank, there would be a $3 fee. I believe it's still $3 um, that your student would be charged for using that ATM uh, Mac machine. Yeah. Laundry. We do have laundry facilities in dormitory buildings and also in the lower level of the hub your student, whenever they arrive on campus during their orientation walkthrough and procedures, will be asked to um, download this app onto their phone so that they are given so many free loads of wash and drying uh, per semester. And if they were to utilize all of those free washes and drying services, uh, through this app, they can pay for more laundry usage, usages. But this, this um, screen that I am showing you, this is up and posted at every laundry facility. So your student can swipe that app on their phone and download it. Printing. All of our students are automatically given so many pages of free printing. There are also printing facilities here on campus, lower level of the hub in the micro room, also in the uh, library department, lower level of the library where they can print um, their pages. Uh, again, there are so many free pages of black and color pages that the students are automatically given through their student ID card. If they absorb all of those printing allotments, they may add more money to their declining balance account. And that's where it will dabble into to uh, print off more pages for them. And then the cost to uh, print over and above what Dickinson offers free for the student is seven cents per black page and 14 cents per color page. And there is the link for the printing uh, site as well to go over more detail for your student and for you. And this has been to my slide. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always email our office at stewaccounts at dickinson.edu or call our office at 717-245-1953. The financial aid office, always email them at finaid at dickinson.edu and their phone number is 717-245-1953. 1308. I also provided dining services phone number on there for you as well, 717-245-1704. And if for some reason there are questions or concerns that I did not cover, please call, call our office or email our office 
if it is something that I am unable to answer, I will direct you to the proper department that can. And I so thank Diane, you very much. Diane, did you do um, the uh, shuttle service? There oh, is a shuttle I did not service. go over transportation. So transportation, um, your student can, uh, we offer shuttle services on campus and it's posted on uh, your Dickinson's Gateway home screen, also on Dickinson's website of when that all takes place. It's linked with our DPS office. We do, whenever school starts, we have a shuttle run that goes to Walmart and Target and things of that nature. And there's designated dates and times that your student can sign up for that. But it's all through our Department of Public Safety office. And if um, the, I believe those those shuttle runs to Walmart and to Target, I believe they are free. But if your student does need transportation to a bus station, the airport, things of that nature, um, there are what we call shuttle runs during breaks that your student can go to public safety and pay, I think it's $10 for a yeah. shuttle run to transport them to that bus, train, or airport station prior to their departure, all through public safety, the Department of Public Safety, DPS. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns that we can cover before? Nope. Nope. All right. Well, again, yes, the thank shuttle you goes to Harrisburg. The shuttle does go to Harrisburg. That yes. was our last question. So thank you, Diane. Thank you very much, everybody. And I welcome you all to Dickinson. And I hope you all have a great remaining few weeks left before you bring your student here on campus. Can't wait to see you all. Take care. Thank everyone. you. Take care. See you in a little bit. Bye. Bye.